That's why I'm a bit sorry to start with such a different topic now. It will really uh, yeah, rip us out of the immersion of your uh, great talk. Um, yes, yeah, so I'd uh, like to thank you for coming and uh, especially staying here uh, to hear my talk. I hope to give a short overview of my research interests and I guess my idea or my hope is that you may have some input for me from Japanese philosophy, how I can um, yeah, extend my interests further. Okay, so my talk is called uh, um, A Phenomenology of Weather and Key. <clears throat> okay. In the first part of my, of my presentation, I will try to reassess the role weather plays in our experience. I will do so with the help of the ph ph phenomenological method. Weather is not, as one may assume, a mere object of experience. Weather is rather that part of that in which all experience constitutes itself. In order to argue for this claim, I will first give a short introduction to the problem of conceptualizing weather and its place, the sky, with the help of the work of anthropologist Tim Ingold. It will become apparent that it only makes sense to talk of the sky and weather regarding our everyday experience, making a phenological instead of a meteorological analysis of the weather necessary. In the second part of this presentation, I give an account of how one can conceptualize the weather phenologically, with the help of Günter Figal's theory of the inconspicuousness of space. My aim is to show that both space and weather are not conspicuous objects of experience, but rather part of that in which we experience all objects and ourselves. By way of concluding, I hope to show that weather is not the sum of things we can point to outside our window, it rather plays an essential role in constituting our being and our self-understanding. With the help of both Ogawa Tadashi and Hisamaha Yuhu, I further hope to show that the interrelatedness between key and weather. Ogawa writes, quote, The phen phenomenology of key and wind elucidates the fact that key fills the body and flows over the world at the same time. Hisayama Yuhu's description of weather experiences as experience of key in his recently published dissertation, Experiences of Key, Embodied Sphere, Atmosphere, Pan-Sphere, will further illuminate our interrelatedness with weather. Hisayama proposes an interesting approach to the untranslatability of Key. Let us not ask what Key is, but how Key is experienced. I hope that my ideas on the phenom phenomenology of weather and Hisayama's thoughts on weather and Key provide an informative starting point for a further polylog on atmospheric phenomena. I should say, all works except uh, Ogawa Tadashi's paper are in German, and I'm just the translations are my own. Um, yeah. In case there are errors there, it's probably <laughs> maybe the translation. Okay, so this is the what I just said, uh, my, my basic overview. So, part one, problems con conceptualizing the sky. In his paper, Earth, Sky, Wind and Weather, Tim Ingold invites us to ask how we experience the sky, the place of weather. To this end, he turns towards research being done in developmental psychology, where the question is being posed how children learn the shape of the Earth. There are, according to researchers, two basic mental models of the Earth. The Earth either appears as a flat or spherical surface. These models correspond to our everyday experience um, and Earth as seen from space. So left is a picture of a black forest, um, <laughs> fittingly, and on the right hand side is a very generic picture of Earth. Once a child has learned that the Earth is spherical, an interesting question arises. Said researchers ask one such child, Ethan, who has already acquired the correct spherical model of Earth to draw a picture of the Earth. So he draws the picture. <laughs> Ethan then proceeds to draw a rough circle on a piece of paper. When he is then asked to draw the sky, he answers, quote, The sky has no shape, you mean space. Yet pressed to draw the sky, he proceeds to describe a ring around the circle depicting the Earth. So the correct model of sky you see is this weird second circle around the first circle. <laughs> <laughs> and, and another child, Darcy, when asked to draw the sky after having drawn a sphere, proceeds to draw clouds above the sphere and houses below it. So this. When pressed by researchers, she is unwilling to admit that if the earth is round, the ground on which houses and trees must stand must also be round. So she has these two models of how sky is conceptualized. 
Not only children have difficulty reconciling the concept of the earth we know with the sky we experience. In another study, which also includes other participants, participants were asked, individually asked first to select the card they thought looked most like the real earth. Two-thirds of the participants, including adults, selected this as the correct model of earth. <laughs> <laughs> the authors of the study conclude that this indicates a scientific understanding of Earth. <laughs> Yet Ingold points out that this picture is strangely paradoxical. On the one hand, we see the correct model of Earth as it would appear from outer space. Yet on the other hand, we see the sky and clouds as they would only appear if we were lying on our backs looking upwards. Both Darcy and two-thirds of the participants were stuck in a confusing perspectival double-take when they are asked to combine Earth and sky. And this co is this confusion really an error, a misrepresentation of what earth and sky are? Ingold argues for, the, for a different interpretation. For in relation to the sky, the earth can figure only in the phenomenal form of the ground upon which people live and on which their dwellings are built. The result, in effect, has not one complete picture, but two quite separate pictures superimposed on the same page. The researchers' descriptions treated us, on the other hand, as exhabitants instead of inhabitants of the earth. Not distinguishing between the physical and the phenomenal order of reality is what finally leads to all the confusion. But how can one approach sky and weather phen phenomenologically, understanding the phenomenal order, where, when both have no shape? Even in the more intuitive mental model of the sky we often see when children draw, it is not immediately clear what the sky is, or weather is, in this drawing. Weather may show itself most immediately in the things of weather the child has drawn, such as clouds and the sun, <coughs> and yet weather is more accurately speaking everything that is in between. The drawing does not account for the temperature, light, wind and air pressure we are all exposed to. All these properties of weather have, we may agree with Ethan, no shape. They are rather, that, they are rather what we experience all shapes in. Weather remains similar to the sky, inconspicuous in our everyday experience. So now I will begin with the, uh, heavier, <laughs> the heavier part of the presentation. In order to show how weather remains inconspicuous and constitutes the condition for the possibility of experience and being, similar to space, I shall first draw on Günter Figal's phenomenal phenomenology of the inconspicuous, which he developed in his most recent book, Unscheinbarkeit, Inconspicuousness. The key principle of phenomenology the following thoughts rest on is the phenomenal correlation. In short, everything which appears before us appears in a threefold structure. Every appearance appears in relation to someone for whom something appears. In every appearance, something appears. In every appearance, for whom something appears and that which appears are mediated. Something holds the appearance together and makes it possible. As we shall see, this third part of the phenomenal correlation would be of great importance in understanding weather, even though, or rather because it is the most inconspicuous. In order to draw closer to the inconspicuous, we shall begin with the most conspicuous, the things which appear to us. In German, the conspicuousness of things is already in their name, Gegenstände, that which stands opposed to us. At first glance, weather may seem like something conspicuous par excellence. Especially in bad weather, weather seems, quite literally, to stand in our way. In the picture Darcy drew, we saw that we often try to depict weather by drawing the things of weather, such as clouds or the sun. And yet, weather is nothing like a thing. Figa finds three characteristics defining things. Things are clear to us at first sight, lifeless and enduring. <coughs> we may think of rainy weather and believe that the raindrops or dark clouds are the weather we are experiencing. But this simplified view of what is going on in the air around and above us does not hold up. Were we to look into a rain shower from inside the comfort of our living rooms, we would never make out a single drop, a single thing. What we see is quite literally sheets of rain. A more obvious example of the things of weather is the cloud. So this picture isn't by me, I should say. Um, sometimes clouds, so-called lenticular clouds, form almost perfect stationary symmetrical shapes in the sky, often around mountains. From where we are, on the ground, they seem almost thing-like. We would expect, judging by the clouds, peace and quiet on the mountaintop. Yet inside one such cloud, on the mountaintop, we would see, or rather feel, that there are actually very strong winds passing through the cloud, 
becoming part of the cloud and leaving the cloud in seconds. So these are such clouds. Whether we will quickly learn is never as it seems at first sight. It is not even clear in its conspicuousness. Yet weather does not only appear as something we experience in the outside world. On the nomadic side of experience I have talked about so far. Even before looking out the window for the first time in the morning or checking the weather report on our phones, weather influences the way we feel. We are under the influence of high and low pressure zones which escape our primary senses. In German, we call someone who is very sensitive to changes in weather, who can sense rain in his or her joints before there are clouds, wetterfühlig. In autumn and winter, we feel, more often than not, under the weather. In these circumstances, weather is not, is not immediately obvious to us. We rather feel in a certain mood and then suddenly realize, after some introspection, that it was the weather which had influenced us inconspicuously. Understanding the weather as something inconspicuous, such as space itself, allows us to understand these different experiences of weather under one concept. So, as objects we experience and as sub something seemingly subjective which we experience in ourselves. <clears throat> as already alluded to, the key to understanding weather is to understand its inconspicuousness. To this end, I will now draw on Figa's theory of inconspicuousness concerning space. Figa defines three characteristics of spatiality. In space, something is immersed in a place, it is admitted in its visibility in a clearance, and it is set apart by an expanse. What may at first seem like a very abstract definition becomes clearer when this concept of speciality is applied to the appearance of things. Things can only be singular and autonomous by being set apart. They can only be so easily accessible as they are because their self-showing is admitted, and one can only refer to a thing because it was immersed here in a place, in a clearance, in an expanse which separates it from other things and from the living beings which refer to it. Space here appears as the condition for the possibility of the appearance of things. Since space is the condition for said appearance, space itself does not appear in the same way as things do. Space appears with the things which are in space. Understood this way, space is not invisible or a mere pure form of intuition, as Kant says, <coughs> space is inconspicuous. The role of space and its inconspicuousness for our experience becomes clear when we think of built spaces, rooms. To be in a room means to see, to hear or to feel what this room lets you see, hear or feel. Rooms limit experience by allowing and excluding certain possibilities of experience which are limited by it. This means that rooms are not experienced in the same way as things which are in rooms. Because rooms limit sight and what can be seen, rooms define our experience second to none. They predetermine how and what we experience in particular ways and are thus quintessentially inconspicuous. The longer you stay in one room, the less attention you pay to the room you have been in, and thus rather experience the room with experience instead of experiencing the room itself. In short, Chica writes, Built spaces are built in conspicuousness. So I should say the past three slides, uh, was obvious, were quotes from uh, Figa's book. If we recall the aforementioned phenomenal correlation, it becomes evident that space is neither something which appears before or which comes from inside of us, but is rather something which allows things and ourselves to appear, which holds this appearance together. Thus, Nothing we experience is outside of space. We ourselves are not inside trying to relate to an outside, but we are rather always already outside in space, which is not only the condition for the possibility to relate to things, but also to ourselves. So to put this another way, we are not a room for ourselves. Um, we are always already in this kind of exposed um, condition. When we think of built rooms, and buildings in which said rooms are. We inevitably think of where they were built and what we see when we look outside of them. Buildings are always built in relation to where they stand. Edward Casey writes in Getting Back Into Place that within the ambience of a building, a landscape becomes articulate <coughs> and begins to speak in emblematic ways. But does not also weather become articulate in such a way? Most obviously, the outside of a building visibly accounts for the weather it is exposed to. But even from the inside, the rooms we live in carry signs of the weather which surrounds the rooms and buildings. 
In modern architecture, the temperature of rooms is regulated by radiators or air conditioning, which make the warmth of the cold outside conspicuous by contrast to the more pleasant weather inside. One should say that there's this norm for temperature that supposedly all office buildings are supposed to be a middle European May. That's like the, the atmosphere you try to create. The size of the windows, which allow the room to be lighter or darker and warmer or cooler, the thickness of the walls, which insulate from the temperature and noises outside, all hint at the weather with which we reckon. The limitations a room creates are, as we have just seen, not arbitrary. A room limits our experience in relation to the weather outside. Inside the room, we already have an intuition of what lies outside. The inconspicuousness of the room, which is the precondition for our experiences in said room, is interwoven with the inconspicuousness of weather. In a sense, the room and buildings we move through in our day-to-day -day lives are mediating our experiences of the outside world in varying degrees of inconspicuousness. When we do go outside, we understand that weather does not only partially define the limitations of a room, but also limits our experience in a similar way as rooms do. A rainy and foggy day can greatly decrease our field of vision so that we see less than on a sunny day. In a sense, the experience of everything is limited by the weather we find ourselves in. Everything outside appears wet, cold and slippery in the rain. During daytime, the gloomy light of a rainy day falls into our rooms, changing our experience and of our intimate spaces and at times forcing us to turn on artificial light. Even in the nighttime, the drumming of the rain on our roof not only reminds us of the weather outside, but also lends its sound to the rooms itself, in which the rain echoes. Both the world outside and our rooms inside are experienced in a different light, often literally, in virtue of current weather. On such a gloomy and rainy day, weather is not as inconspicuous as it usually is, but even on a sunny or unremarkable day, weather defines our experience inside and outside in much the same way. We have not only gotten used to, we have only gotten used to said weather, thus allowing the weather to become more inconspicuous, as with rooms we have gotten used to. We are thus always under the influence of weather in varying degrees of inconspicuousness. Ingold, the person from whom I borrowed the studies earlier, brings further light to our experience of the weather by describing the difference between earth and sky, landscapes and weather. He explains, we experience landscapes by experiencing surfaces, by seeing, hearing and touching things whereas weather is rather an experience of light, sound, and feeling itself. Ingold writes, Perceiving the landscape, then, is a mode of observation. Perceiving the weather is a mode of being. In weather, we experience what allows things to appear. Again, Ingold writes, Strictly speaking, the weather is not what we have perception of. It is rather what we perceive in. This, in turn, explains why the children in the aforementioned study were so perplexed by the question to draw the sky. It is not an object of perception. I would like to summarize before going on to my um, the Japanese philosophy part of my presentation, just uh, what I've said this far, thus far. I would like to summarize how space, room, and weather seem to be linked with one another. Space shows itself as a place, clearance, and expanse. Rooms, then, are phenomena of space. Rooms become their own places, clearances, and expanses. Weather is also a phenomenon of space. Weather creates or includes places, clearances, and expanses. It not only changes how things can be experienced, but can, mit can make experiences themselves impossible when catastrophic weather limits our ability to move. We can never see rooms and weather as the conditions for the possibility of our experience fully. Even if we back into the corner of our, of our room, some room is still behind us, but rooms can be left, weather cannot. We are always inside the weather, unable to view weather from the outside. Even if we see rain in the distance slowly approaching, we can only see the rain in virtue of the clear weather with, which allows us to see so far. It also proves difficult to hide from the <coughs> weather, since the air pressure leaks into any room with even the smallest opening. And even the rooms we try to hide in are themselves media through which we experience weather. Thus, weather seems to be an almost as inescapable, seems to be almost, an almost as inescapable condition for the possibility of experience or being as space itself. To be subjected to and immersed in such inescapable atmospheres 
is also the underlying theme of Ogawa Tadashi's and Hisamaha Yuho's quest thoughts on ki. As if to caution anyone who attempts to construct a theory around ki, Ogawa writes in his paper Ki and the Phenomenology of Wind. The range of senses of the, senses of the word ki is actually vast. It is not easy to grasp the essence of ki for it is ambiguous. You will see that ki fills in both an individual body and all that is in between heaven and earth. So, you know, it's a huge um, category to, to somehow explain. Key thus denotes phenomena such as air, weather, climate, and atmosphere, as well as moods. The interrelatedness of these seemingly different aspects of key becomes most apparent when the atmosphere seems to be filled. Sorry, the interrelatedness of these seemingly different aspects of key becomes most apparent when the atmosphere seems to be filled with a feeling that permeates us, such as when we speak of a tense atmosphere. In a more bodily sense, this permeation takes in place incessantly with every breath we take. The world is disclosed to us in different weather, in different atmosphere or moods, does not mean that these phenomena of key simply color in what we what is already seen, discovered and understood beforehand. The opposite is true. It is a key phenological insight that moods and atmospheres are what open up the world to us. This is what allows moods to play such a fundamental role in being in time. Without them, nothing would matter to us. The following abstract and concrete descriptions of key tie in nicely with what I have said about the weather so far. So this is from Ogawa's paper. The atmosphere or key has no identifiable point or place in space. It overflows and spreads out over the world as a whole to the very end of the world. Atmosphere grasps the human being at the root of his being. The root of his or her being is the body as a limited place of atmosphere. Then he goes on to write, if you have ever experienced the summer in Kyoto, you have only to remember the oppressive weather at the end of a rainy season just before the height of summer. This weather, heavy weather, comes from heat mixed with humidity. This oppressive weather, together with our bodily states, gloominess, crushes everyone's spontaneous will. Ogawa finally also draws the conclusion that it is only through such atmosphere, atmospheres that we can perceive the appearance of world and thing. So now just... Um, one more page. Yuhu Isayama, he wrote his dissertation in Germany on um, key and phenology. I think it hasn't been translated into English yet. It's only in German. He begins his interpretation of experiences of key by pointing out that the term seems to signify something often considered to be two different types of experience, namely our inner feeling as well as the outer atmosphere. Key seems to name something that lies between subject and object. This leads Hisayama to conclude that key is an alternative concept to what Hermann Schmitz has called the singularism and constellationism of Western philosophy, which tries to understand world in terms of singular things that add up to more complex structures. Hisayama tries to account for different instances of key with the help of spheres. Key in terms of spheres is a special phenomena, yet these spaces are no less felt than seen. In order to draw closer to experiences of key, Zayama differentiates, as the title of his book suggests, between the sphere of embodied experience, atmosphere, and pan-sphere. Mm -hmm. According to Hisayama, our embodied experience and our experience of atmospheres can be felt in varying degrees of consonance or dissonance. Experiences of grief may take the form of something that tinges our whole embodied experience or may fill a room where a wake is being held. That these different spheres exist becomes most apparent when we experience incommensurability between our embodied experience and the atmosphere around us. Someone who is scared of flying, such as myself, is often not only distressed by the fact that she is flying, but more disturbingly by the fact that everyone around her is behaving so nonchalantly about being trapped thousands of meters above ground in a metal tube. That these two spheres, embodied experience and atmosphere, can be experienced as dissonant or consonant leads to the insight that this dissonance or consonance is experienced in a further sphere which encompasses both, namely the pan-sphere. So this is what this picture is supposed to um, elucidate. Said pan-sphere is experienced when we experience such a unity or harmony between all other spheres that we are unable to differentiate between spheres in our experience, a state of absolute immersion. Isayama reads the work of 
Soseki Natsume as different themes on the resonances of embodied sphere and atmosphere. Okay, I think I will maybe just stop my presentation at this point because I've already gone a bit over time. Um, I would have just otherwise shown a quote from his book, um, as, um, Sa um, Sanchio. Yeah, why not? So it's maybe a nice ending. So this is the... No? So um, Murakami points out in his introduction to uh, um, 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 Sa <laughs> Sanchiro that it's interesting that in this book people keep looking at the sky, whereas in all other books their characters seem to be forced to look at the ground and to be confronted with their own problems and so on. So this is just this is Murakami in the uh, in the introduction to this book, which I will just yeah. I'm sorry to, 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 to rip it away from you, but this is now from the book itself. Um, the sky was so clear before, said Minoko. Now the color is all muddied. Sanjiro took his eyes from the stream and looked up. This was not the first time he had seen a sky like this, but it was the first time he had heard the sky described as muddied. And she was right, he saw. There was no other way to describe this color. Before he could say anything in reply, however... Miniko spoke again. It's so heavy, it looks like marble, she said, using the English word. She was looking up high, eyes narrowed. Then she moved her narrowed eyes slowly until they were turned upon Sanshiro. It takes, it does look like marble, don't you think? Sanshiro had no chance but to agree. Yes, it looks like marble. Miniko <laughs> fell silent. After some minutes, it was Sanshiro who spoke. Under a sky like this, the heart, Kokoro, becomes heavy and the senses key become light. What do you mean by that? Minoko said, asked. Sanchidro had not meant such much of anything by it. Instead of answering her question, he said, it's a comforting, dreary sort of sky. It seems as if it's about to move, but then it never does. Minoko began watching another far-off cloud. So this is really a very unsatisfying uh, um, talk about weather. Anyway, I, I, I feel as though this um, shows that, weather is that the same weather can be experienced differently and it plays, in a sense, the medium of self-discovery. So people only are able to basically um, understand their own experiences often um, <coughs> on the background of um, weather experiences. And in fact, at one point in the book, um, a friend of um, Sanjiro asks him, um, how do you feel when you look at a sky like this? That be it. Thank you. Thank you. So it's 20 past five, but I think we can stay maybe three or four minutes for a couple of questions. <coughs> well, there's uh, very lot of things, but the, the one thing is if you. If you not speaking Japanese yet, and one thing that maybe the, the might be interesting for you, starting from Ingold, is that actually the one character, Sky, is also was also was also used by Chinese inventors to as a translation for Indian Shunya, so emptiness itself, and also is now used in well, as Kukan, um, to just mean speciality, mm -hmm. also in a philosophical sense. So it's a it's in talking on a Japanese side that's really embedded in language itself. Then there's, um, there's could be really a lot of very similar topics, but you were, you were talking about rooms, that's, that's a wonderful insight, and about weather. There's something in between rooms and weather at large, or space, or even, and there's landscape. That's a category that is sort of lacking mm -hmm. in. It's particularly lacking this sort of unconspicuous air life landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, because we, the, one, the one way we talk about panorama, scenery, so something visible or the shape of the land, the, the air is sort of illuminated. Whereas in, in Asian languages we have fuke, so we have wind and shadow, or shadow and color, mm -hmm. or wind and light. All these words for landscape are actually really close to these atmospheric meanings. Mm -hmm. But it's I think it's a really just as complex phenomenologically mm -hmm. as speciality at large mm -hmm. and weather and uh, more closed rooms. Mm -hmm. It would be uh, an, interesting, an interesting viewpoint. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Just time for you to not any questions. No. <laughs> I think I'll ask you afterwards for the for the names and so on. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your um, excellent talk. Um, I would like to uh, ask if you would like to develop this idea with uh, Wachinji Ketsuro's uh, uh, concept of Futo, or it is translated as a climate yeah. in English. So, but it is a kind of problem because uh, I think climate, uh, or uh, rather, you know, uh, weather uh, within the concept, it is not Wachinji's idea. So. What would be your, your um, thought about, you know, if you have to develop this idea with Watsuji? So, I mean, the, the, I got the idea from Watsuji, so during my undergraduate degree, I, I was lucky enough to have a course on Fudo, and that's where I, and his critique of Heidegger's speciality is what kind <coughs> of brought me into trying to think of the pheno phenomena more uh, better, I guess. But I was then soon disappointed in the actual uh, phenomenology of weather phenomena, which is, you know, in Fudo, a bit lacking because that obviously isn't his main his main point. But the introduction to Fudo, where he describes um, how what is cold is a subject or object and so on, that seems very very interesting. Um, so I, that I would definitely affirm if I if, if I were to continue <laughs> my, my research on this, and I also think that there's there must be some link between understanding weather phenomena phenologically, accounting for atmospheres, and then accounting for <coughs> climates. It just seems to be, so it would be, I guess, like an extension um, of these phenomena to, to, uh, to higher levels. But speaking uh, phenologically, if you don't know what rain is as a phenomena, you can't speak of monsoon climate, I would say. So that would be maybe useful to, to, to build it very slowly, I guess. Uh, I wonder how one takes account of natural catastrophes mm -hmm. within this framework of weather, I mean, especially if we're talking about Japan, there's a very strong <laughs> consciousness of that. I mean, just flying over here, I finally watched Kimi no Nawa, and I, I didn't know, I didn't read a synopsis about it before, so I was surprised when, I won't give anything away, but a natural disaster plays a very big part in that. Mm -hmm. so, Yes, so I mean that's like the the other really interesting part of the whole weather phenomena that speaking in a um, in a, in a, in a um, being in time framework, he also talks of natural catastrophes. He says there are things which are meaningful and meaningless. So, for example, something can be meaningless because it doesn't matter, but it still has meaning in the sense that it it has no meaning to me, but it's still assigned a meaning. And then he has this other category, the unmeaningful. So something which can never have meaning, and something he, what his example is, is I think natural weather catastrophes, and that there's this whole element of, even if I can account for atmospheric phenomena phenologically, weather, and these catastrophes especially as strong phenomena of weather, point to the fact that there's this whole element of nature as something which I'm confronted with, which has to be accounted for in like a more active way, maybe. So, yeah. But, I mean, to be honest, I chose weather as a topic on purpose because it is not so negative. So I can talk about <laughs> sunny weather and rainy weather and everyone's, you know, still <coughs> feeling good. Whereas usually in, in <laughs> phenomenology, you are often, like, after five slides, you're already in death and illness and sickness just to get to the phenomena, just to say, you know, all things become anxiety, discloses everything, and that's just, I mean, it's maybe right, but... Um, yeah, I, I feel that this is something positive in this in this approach that you don't have it's to. It's a training dad. Stick to the weather. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe questions can be done you for the outside. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Okay, the last, yeah. last, last. I'd like to ask one, uh, please. Because uh, it relates to what Shosan asked. Uh, what for this book was originally translated in English as uh, climate and culture. And I wonder whether or not in your theory culture plays a role. Because you are talking about humans in consciousness of climate or something. When one to be is talking about climate, all not always the element of of culture 
comes in because we understand ourselves in China, we disclose ourselves in China, and we act in response to that. Um, so we build dams or we are building houses or something like that. And maybe what you would say, and here he brings into a very questionable and problematic type ecology of climates in the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, if you would uh, accommodate the notion of, of culture into your phenomenology of climate, would that be the next step to accept this questionable typology of climates? And this is a very long shot, long shot, long shot indeed. But how would you argue to escape the obvious deterministic uh, trap? And this was in old Kawa's quote as well. Mm. He says, the oppressive atmosphere crushes our will. Like there is a representation uh, of cause and effect. And the language is really tricky here. So do we have some thoughts about the issue of culture, climate, types of climate, cultural determinism of climatic Yeah, I think, um, so I think it's actually not that difficult of a, of, a, of a problem. So I would just disagree with what Suji's claim that consciousness becomes conscious in a climate. I think that goes much too far mm. in, in describing the necessity of climate. Mm. And my, uh, what I wanted to do with the Zanjiro quote was to show climate is just a medium of self-understanding. And in that sense, you can have a weather climate, mm. and it makes sense that people who live in the desert as a, as a climate zone have, I don't know, wear a lot of cloth because it shields from the sunshine or whatever. And these are all things, but they don't, they don't determine them. They just are agents in themselves which look in the world for kind of mediums of self-experience. Um, and one of these, apart from all other cultural aspects, natural as aspects, is weather. And these are their reactions. But, I mean, in this way you can also account for how different cultures arise in the same climates. Because it, it, they just have, dip, they just basically, their, the way they understand the weather they are in and their self-reflection is different. And there's like no determinism, I would say. It's more like inspiration. Maybe. Thank you very much. Sorry.